Hey guys, Jason here with Hugo Moto. I'm at Traction Dynamics today with the Traction Dynamics owner Max McAllister. Max is going to talk to us about the uh, Sportster Scrambler kit that we co-developed along with, uh, with Traction. We're really excited about this uh, project and one of the best parts is the ease of installation. Max is going to walk us through that right now. I'm going to try and hit lots of different uh, scenarios for you. So one depending on how, you know, everything from you have a really nice workshop to you have very limited means. Ideally, you have a workbench and a vice. A bench vice is going to be a big one. If you don't, it like, can obviously can still be done. Uh, but starting with the very first step of removing the fork cap, you'll want to try and break the fork cap loose while your fork is on the bike. If you don't have access to a bench vice, that's going to be an important thing. So, um, you know, normally you'll have a ratchet and a socket to take your fork cap loose. If your fork cap is stuck, uh, one tip of the day is put your socket over the top of the fork cap, smash it really good a couple times with a hammer, it will shock the threads and release the threads. We try and use a pair of non-marring type slip joint pliers here, that's, uh, you know, keeps chrome nice and things if you can have access to a nice tool like this. A company called Nipex makes them, K-N-I-P-E-X. These are nice, this is a nice shock quality tool, but that keeps you from marring things. Um, if you have a socket, another tip you can do to keep from marring things up is, you know, just place a paper towel over your fork cap so you don't scratch it up. I'm not uh, against even using a crescent wrench. A crescent wrench in the hands properly used, if somebody knows how to use it, is just as good as anything else. So tighten it properly, if a crescent wrench has a nice wedge to it so it doesn't slip. So same thing, if you've got a nice chrome cap, you can put a, uh, a paper towel around it to protect it. Hold your fork in a vise. A um, couple things that make that easier for a do-it-yourselfer. We obviously have custom-made jaws in our workshop, but for you, um, you can find these pretty readily available. They're a set of aluminum vise jaws. They have all kinds of slots and angles in them that'll help you do a million little different jobs on your motorcycle anytime. Uh, that will let you grab a round tube and hold it uh, pretty, you know, successfully without uh, marring or dinging the tube. You can find those at an automotive supply store in your neighborhood. They're about 15 bucks. Um, and again, they have a multitude of uses. Um, anytime you clamp on your fork, try and never clamp in the area where the seal's gonna slide. So anywhere from your lower triple clamp mount, a lot of times you'll see rust on the tube where your clamps have been mounted. Anywhere from there above is fine to clamp. Just wanna protect the area where the seal's, seal's likely to, is going to slide. So first step, remove the fork cap. Once the fork cap's out, you can take your whole fork away. You're gonna pour out um, your seal, your springs and oil. In old Home Depot, five gallon bucket or paint bucket's fine to collect all the mess. Um, <clears throat> pump the fork and fork leg against each other um, several times to try and get as much of the oil as possible out. The next step is you're gonna need to <clears throat> get the bottom bolt out of the lower fork leg. Ideally, you have a long Allen socket. Sell these little extensions, they're a couple bucks, because you'll need to reach down into this hole to get to that bolt. Again, with your jaws, you can clamp uh, I like to use the brake mounting lugs. That way I'm not using any surface that's gonna be cosmetically visible or damaged in any way. Break that bolt loose. You can run into some trouble here. Typically it'll come apart pretty easily, but a couple things can have gone wrong over time. So first of all is if the last person that worked on the motorcycle assembled this with a powerful air gun, it can be quite really stuck together badly. Um, next one is, is if somebody really screwed you over and they put Loctite on the bolt. There's no Loctite required on this bolt, so Hopefully nobody's done that. In theory, it should spin. You can grab the chrome fork tube, pull down on the fork tube, it puts pressure against the top out spring, and when you spin it, that'll put friction against the bolt to let you back the bolt out, okay? Eventually, you'll feel the tube will shoot loose and uh, out the bottom is going to drop the uh, factory damper rod. This is what we're trying to get out of your fork to replace with the upgraded components. Worst case scenario is you still can't get the bolt out you're gonna need access to an air tool. Run to a friend's shop or, you know, hope maybe you have one, but or run somewhere to a bike shop and have them hit this gun with this bolt with an air gun. And it'll come right out. Once your damper rod is out, there'll be um, another spring with it. That's your top out spring. We're gonna reuse the top out spring. We're not gonna use this piece of junk anymore. This is what we're trying to get rid of. Here's a piston band on it. We're gonna take the piston band off. No tools required. So we're gonna take that band off and uh, 
these parts will assemble back in the same sequence and order. A good product you can find in a lot of automotive stores. It says brake cleaner on it, uh, but this is really uh, like electrical contact cleaner. This company Zep makes it. This isn't a lot of money, but this does a wonderful job. Uh, uh, brake cleaner is kind of nasty and caustic to work around, real brake cleaner. If you can find electrical contact cleaner, that's really the best stuff for doing this job. You'll always want to spray all the parts down completely clean because we are dealing with damping units here. So spray these parts. This cleaner evaporates instantly, leaves no residue. Super wonderful. I recommend a set of mechanics gloves. They sell those at, again at the auto parts store. Keep the chemicals off your hands. Top out spring goes there, piston band, we talked about that. If you know that the condition of your forks are good, they've been serviced recently, the seals are good and such, you can go on and just install um, our new components at this point. Your new um, Traction Dynamics and Hugo co-branded co uh, damper rod kit here. This rod is uh, CNC machined. Uh, to extremely tight tolerances. We're trying to significantly improve the fit and function of the, the damper rod in the fork and making the component much higher quality. By doing that, it allows us to run a thinner oil in the fork than you would stock. With a stock low-grade rod, the surfaces are not even straight or smooth or uniform on it. It gives an inconsistent form of damping. Plus, the rod needs to be modified in special ways. Uh, the, the holes need to be different diameters in different locations to interact with the uh, the blow valve that we're going to use in the kit. Instead of trying to modify this, this low quality rod, we're installing one that's got all the work's done for you. It's just clean, you're just going to bolt it in. And uh, one of the tips for that, I'll touch on it a second time, you would put the rod back up in the fork and you'll just need to find anything you got around the house that's a couple feet long that you can poke up in and hold this up in the fork while you tighten, start the nut thread and tighten the nut back and uh, get it tight again. Torque spec, we use the torque spec, is tight. And uh, when I say tight, um, these bolts, because there's a copper crush washer under it, um, it will seat and crush the crush washer. You can reuse the crush washer, the crush washers don't leak, they're fine. Um, but it will seat. Um, if it wants to turn, it's not tight enough. So there's another situation where you might have to have the air gun again. Once in a while that happens where you're gonna have to bump it. Not go, gah, 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 gah. And that's not what we're after. You just go bump, and that's usually all it takes. Da -da. You come back and check with the ratchet again. If you pull on the ratchet, the ratchet doesn't move, the bolt is tight enough. If it'll spin, it's spinning on the crush washer and it hasn't taken a full bite yet. So that's a, kind of another one of the pro tips. And if it doesn't take that full bite, it might weep out of that hole. So um, that's, that's just your sign. So if this isn't tight, um, and we're not trying to break it, this isn't what we're we're not trying to do this either, right? You know, so this isn't the, the torque spec. It's just, you know, this is by hand. No, no veins popping out, no, no veins popping out, or, you know, going crazy, all right? Uh, from there, we would refill. So far, we've taken off the fork cap, poured out the spring and spacers and oil. We've removed the stock damper rod. We'll need to take up the chrome, the decorative chrome cap on the fork. There's a notch on the inside of the fork tube to allow you to tap, tap this cap upward. Um, to do that, you need to find some sort of a punch. You want to use the flat-headed punch, nothing pointed, because we want to be able to take the punch, and you can use brass or steel, it doesn't matter. We want to be able to get a flat head up against that. So when we tap on it with a hammer, we drive that um, dust cap off, the decorative chrome decorative cap off. All right. Inside the fork leg, we will find a dust seal. The dust seal, simply pry up with a small flat blade screwdriver. You can just force, gent gently force it in and twist it and work your way around. The dust seal will come up. You can take that off and set it to the side. When you look down into the tube, you're going to see your fork seal in there. So you'll see the seal. On that seal is this wire spring clip. Same thing, it's very easy to extract. You just take a screwdriver, pry it, that spring will, spring will pop up right around the chrome tube. Once the clip is out, you just take the two halves of the fork and, and bang them apart. Slide hammer them apart from each other. Bang, bang, bang. It'll come apart. Bang, it'll come apart. Here's what you're looking at. All right, you take your old fork seal off. If your bike's been ridden for more than a year, I'd recommend that you do this process. Um, because all kinds of things can get in. A seal that had come out of this fork, there's rust and corrosion on the seal. It's actually eating into the seal surface where rust is actually broken through. This seal is ruined and uh, this fork would be leaking. 
Uh, there's a backup washer that goes behind the seal. Your, uh, we call it upper fork bushing. Some people call it the outer fork bushing. And then on your fork leg is your inner fork bushing or lower fork bushing. You'll spread that with a little screwdriver to get it off. Odds are high that your lower fork bushings will be worn and will require replacement. The upper ones, sometimes, sometimes not. It's not a lot of money if you're going this far into it. I suggest replacing all four bushings and never reuse a fork seal. This, it's a waste of time and effort and money. What we're looking for when we're going to inspect fork bushings is they need to have a nice full complete coating of Teflon all the way around them. What you'll see is the Teflon will wear off and it'll be down to bare brass. This is highly likely you'll find this when you, once you take your forks apart. Uh, typically by 15, 20,000 miles, they'll be completely worn out. The upper bushing or outer bushing tends to wear less. Again, these aren't a lot of money. It's worthwhile to order them from your Harley-Davidson dealer or we can supply them through Hugo Moto for your kits. We have a couple of different options for you if you're a do-it-yourselfer. We'll have a parts kit and also a small do-it-yourself tool kit. You'll find in the bottom of their fork, a little cone um, that's going to be down in the bottom of the leg it'll just fall out all these parts have to be cleaned now clean 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 I can't stress the cleanliness enough with your contact cleaner you're going to spray down into the tube vigorously you're going to find a lot of mud and gook and sludge down in there and you want to when you look down in it hopefully you see it's just as clean as a, as a whistle in there that's what it's got to be like when you're done a little piece of Scotch-Brite, you know, that you might find by your kitchen sponge or whatever. Clean the bore where the seal's going to sit. We want that to be no corrosion, um, clean and very uh, smooth for when we drive in the new seals. A lot of times, again, corrosion in there over time. And again, it's been on age, so we want to make sure that that's all removed and smoothed down. Over time, fork tubes get, um, receive all kinds of damage in a multi multitudes of ways. Well, as a bug hit in your fork tube and drying, Rocks, you know, from if you're riding with your buddies, rocks being flung up off the road will bing and they'll ding your fork tube because they kind of make a little crater. They make a dent in the chrome, but they push some chrome up. And so that's above the surface and that's what tears your seal up. So it'll cause a seal leak. Just sand, dust, and grit being uh, drugged down into the seal areas over time. Once it's in the seal, as your fork, chrome fork tube slides up and down against the seal, those pieces of grit and debris in there will make vertical scratches all up and down the fork tubes. Some of them can be bad. So we want to polish all that out so we start with a smooth, clean surface and that will dramatically increase your seal life. So all the time you'll see people who say, I just replaced my fork seals and it leaked again right away. Well, that's going to be, going to be the reason why is it just wasn't prepped properly. So using these, you know, a set of these soft jaws, you want to, and a vise. Um, it would be difficult, but you can sort of grab between your legs if you had to. This job is going to be difficult without a vise. So you can clamp on that. And uh, you need a piece of emery cloth, uh, 400 grit is good, you want something fine. And you're going to shine the tube in kind of like shoe shine boy, in uh, like third rotation increments. So you'll just take the tube and you're going to go down the tube like this. And you're looking for scratches and dings and you want to smooth them down. Just like this. When you get a segment nice, um, you'll just take the tube. Rotate it about a third of a rotation and replant. And you'll come and see. So you, you can see, actually, I'll just show you for fun. Here's where a triple clamp was, was gripping this. Just so you can see, that might be what a scratch might look like. So this will just take it right out. Now, if you see anything left behind, um, you need to work on it. Um, if this were in the sliding seal area, if you had any kind of mark or anything in the area where your seal is going to slide, you're going to want to work on it till it goes away. All right. Sometimes if you have a bad ding or a bad scratch, you may actually want to gently sand that area closely. Try not to take, you know, damage any more of the chrome than necessary, but you're going to have to get the ding or the scratches out. So you may have to do something more detailed, then come back, polish that area again so it blends in all nice and smooth. All right. So you'll repeat that in thirds. When your tubes are all done, again, you're gonna clean them thoroughly with your contact cleaner. One tip that's important to point out um, on these Sportster forks, down at the bottom where you remove your inner bushing, your lower bushing, these bores here fill with gunk over time, sediment and grit and the Teflon that gets ground off and all kinds of junk gets down. 
into this housing. So Spray in there thoroughly till all the gunk in the till it flows clear and clean. Um, if you have access to any kind of a bottle brush or anything that you can ram through this thing several times, that you want to make sure that the ID is clean as well. So when you got everything clean enough that even your uh, mom would, would would approve, when mom would approve, then you kind of get to the point where you where we're ready to assemble. We have all clean parts, polished tubes. Uh, we'll snap on your um, inner bushing. Uh, our bushing. The backup washer has a rounded edge and a sharp edge for just from its act of being stamped. Sharp edge goes up towards the seal. All right, your seal. I'm going to show you a quick little prep with that. Use some grease here. They do make specific seal greases. Um, you're just going to line the lips of the seal with grease. Okay. Um, you want it kind of packed actually with, with that grease. So it's full, and then we like to take a little bit of grease and just kind of just let wipe this board gently. This helps the seal helps the seal go in. We're not trying to grease it. We're just lightly we're just putting a lubricant on the surface. It helps the seal go home neatly, cleanly, and evenly. Our seal. Be gentle with this. You know they do cut a chamfer on the on top of the tube, but you know you're still going to. This is a seal. Be gentle with it. Don't force this thing. You're going to push it on. This a seal has a springiness to its nature by so push it on it, glide it over, don't force it. Um, don't you know just treat it with respect. Two goes together. Don't forget your bottom out cone, right? So we'll hold that in there. Um, you'll need some sort of seal driver. You may purchase online. Lots of people sell them. Uh, some people will fashion something. It is sometimes possible to find um, the correct diameter PVC tube. I haven't tried that for this uh, 39 mil fork. Um, and, but you can sometimes find that if you're a piece of PVC that you can fashion. The main thing we're concerned about is not damaging the inner lip. So this is a tool that's worthwhile having. If you are doing this job yourself and you don't expect to do it often, Sometimes when I used to work at a bike shop, I, you know, people will just come in and say, well, you drive this seal. Sure, you go by the bike shop. Maybe you have a friend with a driver. They're going to drive it. Throw the guy five or ten bucks. So instead of spending 50 bucks on a tool, if you don't want, there's another, there's a way around it. Um, uh, the clip goes in next. So you just kind of start the clip in on all edges. You poke it in. You want to make sure it snaps all the way down. And when you look at the clip, you'll be able to see that the wire disappears into the clip groove and you want to inspect that all the way around make sure you'll see the little humps where you can grab to pull the clip out but you want to make sure the clips gotten down into the groove everywhere and again that nice clicking sound you heard is always a good is a good sign all right dust seal we put a light coat of grease on the inside of the dust seal the seal goes over and that'll actually sometimes just slide in um, if it doesn't, the same thing, you just tap it with your driver to make sure it's seated. All right. The chrome cap, we fashioned a little tool here. This is can be tricky to put back. You want to be delicate or gentle with it so you don't uh, bend it up. You'll have to tap that very, very gently and slowly so you don't dent it or ding it or mess it up. All right. If you take the two halves of the fork too far apart and you haven't kept it oriented, that little cone can float around in there. So you want to make sure before you put the rod in that the cone and everything is lined, is back in its bore and lined up. Otherwise you do have to play a little bit of Rubik's Cube job where you separate this, get it to drop in, and then put the tube back over it. So next step is your damper rod to go in. Sometimes you can get your first thread started. Um, by just holding it vertically. You'll know the rod is down there and is on the bottom if when you're pushing on the bolt you can feel the weight of the rod. So I've got the rod, I feel the weight of the rod. I'm just going to thread this now and get it started. Now that basically is, is at home, it's seated. It stopped, you know. I'm, this is good. I'm not, no foot on the vise, no, nothing crazy. That's good to go. When you pull it up, you'll be able to feel your top out spring. Um, 
And final kind of pro check. Um, we want to feel that the tube slides smoothly, okay? If your bike's ever been laid down or you have any kind of concerns that the tubes might not be straight, um, if you take both of your tubes while they're out of the bike, turn them upside down to each other, pull them up to the light. If one's bent, you'll see light through the tubes. Any light, the fork's bent. So what you're gonna do is hold them up, look for light. Take one tube, roll it 90 degrees, look for light. Roll it 90 degrees, look for light. Roll it 90 degrees, look for light. Then do the opposite with the bottom. We're trying to make sure from all from 90 degrees around both tubes that they're both straight. As long as they're nice and straight and you see no light, you're good to go. If they're bent, you'll need to run out somewhere to a shop and let them strip to them up for you. Most shops charge $25 to $40 to straighten a bent fork tube. If your bike's been laid down enough to where you can actually see a crease in the tube in the metal, you can see it with your eyes. The odds are you're going to have to replace your fork tube as well at this point. So it's a good time. Most bike shops won't straighten a tube with a crease in it because it's possible for it to crack, um, A, while straightening, or B, while you've been riding, it's been weakened. The other possibility at this point for trouble is if somewhere along the way something really impacted your lower fork leg, if it's got a dent in it, when the bushings come by, um, it, it won't want to pass. So you're going to check this to see that it strokes freely, nice and free, and it does. In theory, it should almost drop you know, against the grease nicely by itself, so this fork's in perfect shape. Fill the oil fork with oil, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to try and supply you with two different ways of doing that. One is by a volume specification, and another one, you, the preferred method is set in it by oil level. Um, volume will only work and can only be used if you've taken a fork completely dry and washed it completely down and every, every part's clean and you start like this. So you, you won't be able to take... Um, and in a fork where you just pull the rod out and it's still full of oil and everything and uh, be able to set it properly. Um, <clears throat> so by volume, pouring in a volume. Um, oil, even though it doesn't look like there's a lot, dramatically affects the volume of oil. And um, the reason the amount of oil in the fork is important is because it controls the bottoming resistance in the fork. And what we're actually doing is setting, tuning the column of air that's sitting on top of the oil. And so... Um, a higher column of oil is more bottoming resistance and a lower column of oil is less bottoming resistance. But we're going to supply you with the right amount of bottoming resistance so your bike just works right when you put it together. So if you're going to set your forks by oil level, you can just fill the fork at this point. It's very important to bleed the fork. So we're just going to pump on this fork. You'll feel it skipping and eventually it'll catch and you'll feel the damping you know, consistent come all the way in. You want to do that all the way from top to bottom so you feel it that it's got nice even damping. When the forks blend, um, you'll set the oil level, we'll prescribe a distance for you, you'll set the, the distance to the stopper on the fork, you set this down in, the fork on the stopper, you just pull on the syringe, it's going to suck out the unnecessary oil and it's set to the correct height. If you're super low budget, uh, you can use a tape measure and uh, a paper towel and pull some oil out and wring it out until you get it to the, the right depth. This is, uh, can be used on a multitude of motorcycles, so um, you just, you'll set your prescribed depth or oil level, and that's all there is to it. You'll want the fork slightly overfilled, we'll call it, you know, overfilled. That way, if we had the oil to here, when we put our tool in, our tool's below the oil. That way, we want to make sure you suck on something. If you pull on the tool and you just suck air, you don't have enough oil in the fork to set the level. Oil level's too low. Uh, so at this point, then we can drop the little valve in. All right, and this uh, little valve is what gives us um, a great level of performance and dramatically improves the compression damping side of the fork. These holes in the bottom of your fork control compression damping from the factory from Harley-Davidson. Um, but the hole is a fixed amount of damping and it works in a certain way. It works as what we call a velocity squared damping curve. So the faster you move it, the more damping you get. But you only get one curve. So the problem is, these holes will not provide enough damping to give you a nice firm controlled feel to the platform of the bike, to the way the bike handles while you just ride it in, in general. And th yet those holes are too small to adequately allow oil to pass through it when you hit a sharp bump. So what our kit does is these holes are made so large that they have no longer any effect. We place this bluff valve on top of it 
and this valve has much smaller holes than you would find in the factory rod. Those give you a nice firm feel to the bike, um, controls brake dive, and keeps the bike generally calm and planted as you ride it. But then when you hit a bump, this spring pops, and let's see if you can see around my hand, but that whole hat blows up into the air, or up open so the oil can pass by. So then you get a giant passage that is much bigger, and that's what allows it to soak bumps. So when you hit a bump, that valve pops open, oil flows by, the spring pushes it right back shut, and you're back to having that firm controlled feeling again. It gives you the best of both worlds. So you'll drop that in. I'm gonna put that down in there. Our forks dry, but that's fine. Preload spacer. So one final check for preload. If everything's together and assembled properly, um, when you go to put your cap on, you're going to have about what you see here is about three quarters of an inch, 20 millimeters um, of preload or so on the spring. If for some reason you see this, okay, it's, um, that's a great sign that the, uh, the valve is not seated properly. It might be cocked. Push on it, turn it, push on the spring, and a lot of times it'll just pop down into its seat at that point. And that's usually all it takes. Um, if for some reason you put and the cap was no preload at all, there might be a problem with your spacer length. So super check to make sure everything's right at the last moment. So other than that, should be only take hand pressure to put your cap down and get it to start that first thread. Um, again, you shouldn't have any major nightmare to get this started. Okay, you shouldn't be. You know that's that shouldn't be like that. All right, um, and you'll just run the cap down. Uh, does not need to be dramatically tightened, okay? This is not, uh, does not come apart. Look, that's it. Do you see me? I just snugged it. That's all you have to do. No air tool, don't, this is not a axle bolt, you know? That's all that's required to keep this together. Uh, so this is a completed fork with oil and everything. So we'll just kind of push on it and see how it works, right? So, um, we, you should be able to push gently on it and see the spring move, shouldn't be fighting with you. Shouldn't take much effort at all. That means we've got the right amount of preload on it. And in fact, you can probably hear it if you come close. It's not just shooting back like a spring. Here's a fork with no damping at all. So it's just gonna be kind of a pogo stick. So if your seals have leaked, um, your oil's too thin, it's gonna look like a pogo stick, all right? It's no control at all. So what we're looking for, is a reasonably quick return to the fork. We, need to, we should be able to feel it resist us as we push down on it, and it should return quickly. If your fork were to come up incredibly slowly, like you're walk, you can actually like really watch it, the oil is too thick. We're gonna prescribe the right oil for you. One thing to be aware of, it's just kind of a general limitation of damper rod forks is in temperature extreme, their performance will change. So typically around 40 degrees Fahrenheit and below, the fork is going to behave very slow and stiff. And above 90 degrees, it's gonna get quicker and faster because the oil gets thinner. It's just the nature of a damper rod fork and one of the limitations of it. If you happen to live in one of those temperature extremes, you might wanna vary your oil viscosity from our prescribed baseline. So, or you could let us know or let the guys at Hugo say, you know, I live in uh, Alaska and six months a year I'm gonna ride my bike and it's gonna be below 40 every day. Or you could say, I live in Death Valley and, I, and it's 90 degrees on Christmas Day. So just let us know and we can send uh, an alternate oil if necessary with your kit. Right? You'll reassemble per your factory manual, from your factory Harley-Davidson manual. And I've just thrown in all the tips to do a nice pro job on this for you. But if you have any questions, the factory service manual is also a great way. The procedure is basically going to be the same as if you were changing a fork seal. And uh, we get your fork together nice, clean and neat and give you a, a high level of performance and a great increase for what, you, what you've been looking for out of your new Hugo Moto customized Harley Sportster. Cut! Awesome. Right. That was awesome! Fantastic!